Howdy everybody, thanks for joining me for Photoshop Elements 9 for photographers. As you are about to find out, I absolutely love Elements. As we were talking earlier, it's fabulously user-friendly and will help you do all kinds of things. And with the different editing modes that Elements has, you can start out at one skill level and the program lets you grow with your skill level through the different editing modes that we're gonna be checking out. So, but first I have a few things that I wanna share with you. First of all, who the heck am I? <laughs> well, I've written a couple of books. I wrote a big old honking book called Photoshop CS5, The Missing Manual, big old 900 page thing. And my most recent book was iPhoto 11, The Missing Manual. And that's actually a class we're gonna be having on Thursday. The publisher, O'Reilly, has given me permission uh, to give y'all a fabulous discount, 40% off the print books, and that's really good because that Photoshop one is really expensive. 40% uh, off the print books and 50% off of the eBooks with a special coupon code. You have to purchase it from O'Reilly.com and then at checkout, enter the super secret code, which isn't gonna be secret anymore, <laughs> off D, A-U-T-H-D, to get that discount. Also, if you have not planned your family vacation yet, why don't y'all come on the Danube with me? <laughs> we are going to have one heck of a fun trip. Uh, it's my first annual Danube digital photography cruise. <laughs> and we're going to be cruising from Budapest over to Nuremberg during all the holiday markets. So imagine the shopping that is going to take place. It's going to be fabulous. I'm going to be teaching three uh, photo editing classes on board. We're going to talk about how to take better pictures no matter what camera you have, editing in elements and iPhoto. And then I'm going to be leading two photo walks onto um, some of the little stops that we go into to put theory into practice. So if you're interested in that, trot on over to Photo Cruise with Lisa, with an E.com. Also, I've got a slew of tutorials on my own website, graphicreporter.com. There's probably a hundred elements tutorials on there. So to find them, simply go to the tutorials and quick tips link at the top and then choose your software and you have a slew of step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step tutorials. So no matter your, your proficiency level, you can absolutely follow along with that. Also, I'm pleased to say that I'm the chief evangelist for iStockPhoto.com, the world's most fabulous resource for royalty-free imagery, vector illustrations, flash uh, components, uh, video and audio. It's really a multimedia one-stop shop. So I always tell folks, you know, for photographers, why would you need to purchase images from iStock Photo? Well, we're going to get into creating a lot of really neat collages. And if you had a shot of a, a romantic couple and you wanted to blend it in with a bed of roses, well, you might not actually have the bed of roses shot. So that's a good reason to use stock photography in conjunction with your own to create unique pieces of art. And I always tell folks, if a bed of roses isn't appropriate, well, hey, you can find anything <laughs> that would be appropriate, even if it's a bed of nails, <laughs> on iStock Photo. And speaking of iStock Photo, uh, the folks at Creative Live have a fabulous deal. If you go to iStockPhoto.com slash creativelive.php, creativelive.php, then you can get 20% off of iStock Photo credits. Yeah, that's a good deal there. Uh, also, we mentioned that we're going to be giving away a couple of subscriptions to Elements Techniques magazine. This is a fabulous magazine. I absolutely love it. It's one of the few that I read religiously when it comes in every month. It's thin enough that it's not overwhelming so you don't get magazine stress. <laughs> and it's got just enough advertising in it, I guess, to keep the publication afloat because the darn thing is filled up with tutorials and photography tips and all kinds of wonderful things. So do take, check that out at photoshopelementsuser.com. All right, so we're going to, like I said, uh, look at all the different editing modes that Elements has. We're going to start out in guided edit mode, which is Elements kind of friendly. It's like a, having a teacher sit beside you. Then we're going to move on to quick fix mode, which uh, Elements took all the most frequently used uh, correction tools for lighting and color and stuck them down on the right hand side of your screen as a series of sliders. And then we're going to get into some really pro level stuff using full edit mode. But first we need to go through a spot of image editing theory and it won't be too much. <laughs> but there's a few concepts that will make your elements life easier if you understand going into it. And the first one is what the heck are these digital images made out of anyway? Well, if you're looking here on the screen, we've got a, a cross section of this sunflower that I've blown up really far and I've zoomed in probably at about 
600% or so. And at that zoom level, you can actually see the square uh, dots of color, basically, for lack of a better way to put it, that the image is made up of. Okay, so this is what's getting captured in your camera, blocks of color. Now, normally those blocks of color are so small that you can't see them individually. However, if you've ever printed anything off of the great interwebs, then it probably looked like it was made from Legos. So, what controls the size of these pixels? That is the, the measurement called resolution, and that's all resolution really is. So pixels can be any size at all, but it's the resolution measurement that controls how big or how, how small they are. And when you're sending an image to a printer, you want those pixels to be small enough so that you can't see them. So it doesn't look like it's made out of Legos. But if you're not going to print that image, you're just gonna have it available online, like on screen or on your computer display in a slideshow, or if you're just gonna post it on the web, then the pixels can be bigger because our eyes can only see so much detail and the screen uh, works out about 72 pixels per inch give or take so 72 pixels per inch is a pretty good size pixel but on the screen our eyes can't see the individual ones but printers are capable of much more finer detail so you want to make those pixels really really tiny before you print so all that boils down to say that resolution doesn't make a hill of beans difference in anything until that image is headed to a printer you just don't have to worry about that measurement at all, no matter what anybody tells you. <laughs> so what we've been talking about here is high resolution for a printer is when you uh, squish those pixels down where they're really, really small and pack a lot of them into a tiny space. Another an analogy that I've come up with, it's kind of funny, kind of goofy, kind of funny, to explain resolution is if anybody's ever made cookies or anything involving brown sugar, you know how you can pour brown sugar into a measuring cup? And if you don't pack it down, let's say that the loose granules come up to about the one cup line. That's kind of like low resolution, right? So then if you put your hand in that measuring cup and you push the sugar down, you've got the same volume of granules, okay? But now they're smashed together, they're compressed, and they're a little bit smaller, and they take up less surface space. So now that what was a one cup full of brown sugar now looks about like a half a cup of brown sugar. And that's kind of what's going on in the whole resolution thing. So the higher the resolution number, the tinier those pixels are and the more tightly compressed they are in your little measuring cup. Now I'm craving cookies. <laughs> So low resolution is more like the brown sugar before you compressed it down. The, the granules are kind of big, loosely packed. So that's low resolution, which is great for on screen. Now the reason this becomes so confusing is because you can't see the difference on the screen. Remember how we said our eyes can only uh, see so much detail. A 72 pixel per inch image looks exactly like a 300 pixel per inch image. And I love this photo, it's from iStock, of the business people with the <laughs> antennas. So that's why it's so confusing. But we're gonna talk about exactly how to find out what the resolution is of your image, how many pixels you've got in your image, because that's really the most important thing. How many pixels do you have to work with by width and height? Okay, so we're gonna look at all that. I wanted to touch on file types just a little bit before we get into editing, because that's also helpful, because there's so many file types. Which one do you need to use when? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Most of the time, you're gonna be dealing with JPEGs, okay, which is the first one here on this list. They can hold uh, tons of color, which makes them perfect for photographs, okay, any kind of continuous tone image. They're great for transferring over email or posting on the internet. The only problem with JPEGs is it's a lossy, file type. So what happens, I always describe it as a stair step of, of quality. So if you were capturing JPEGs with your digital camera, let's say that we start out on the top step of our quality staircase here. If you open up that JPEG and you do some editing to it and in Elements and you save it as another JPEG, well, there's another level of compression that happens, okay? So now you're dealing with a quality level that's a little bit less than the first one. If you were to open that JPEG up, do some editing, save it as a JPEG, you're going down another stair in quality and you keep on going down. That's why when we first open up our JPEGs and we start doing editing in Elements, we're gonna save them as what's called the native Photoshop Elements document. That way no compression takes place, no fine details getting thrown out. 
Um, so that's what we're going to be using. So the top one is JPEG, and I've got a little example of what each one looks like. And I'm really not that vain. It's just the only picture I had in all three <laughs> file formats back in my blonde days. So the next file type you might encounter is called GIF. Uh, that's great for line art, for email or web. It also um, has compression, so it will make the file size nice and small, so you can transfer it and things like that. I always like to to describe GIFs as um, cartoons. They look like cartoon artwork to me. So solid blocks of color, if you think of it like that. A great thing about GIF is that it supports transparency as well. So if you've ever needed to erase the background of an image and save that transparency so that when you post it up on the web, you can see through that image to whatever is on the background, uh, you would use a GIF or a relatively new file format called a PNG. P -N -G. PNG has been around for probably seven, eight, nine years now. It's starting to get a lot more um, support. It used to be for years Internet Explorer would not support uh, transparency pings or pings that had transparency. So it's taken a little while for them to really get on board, but people are now using pings more than GIFs. Uh, another great thing about pings is that it's a lossless file format, meaning it's full quality. Okay, so that's a really great thing. So uh, for photographers, you know, we want our photos to look as good as we can, you know, on the web. So I, I use pings more often than not these days for, to get the best quality available. The other kind of file format you're going to encounter is one that's been used for print by graphic designers forever and ever, and it's called TIFF. And that is a lossless file format. But to be honest, you can print straight from Elements. So unless you're having to send the image to somebody else to print that doesn't have Photoshop Elements, then you probably won't have to use TIFFs at all because you can print, like I said, straight from Elements. So we're going to be opening up the JPEGs or RAW file format images. Elements can open up a RAW file as well. And, but as soon as we start doing anything to those files, we're going to save them as a native Photoshop document. And the extension is PSD, and that actually stands for Photoshop Document. And it's the same file format that the big expensive version of Photoshop uses. So that's just a little ditty on file formats. Now we're just about to hop into Elements. I wanted to spend just a couple of seconds on a, a suggested workflow. Now that's all this is, a suggested workflow. Y'all are grown-ups. You have your own workflow. <laughs> I'm not trying to change it. In Texas we have a thing, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> so, but my own workflow that I find that works good for me is to import, obviously, the photos first. Hard to edit them if you have not yet imported them. Then you're going to crop them because why spend time editing out a blemish or fixing a background or taking out, you know, whatever it is, if that part of the photo isn't going to be in there to begin with. So I always crop, you know, get rid of the distracting elements. And um, then I go into color correction, lighting correction. You want to get the color and tone looking right. And then that's when we're going to start retouching. We're going to go in there and zap those bags and blemishes, all the things that I wish I could do in the mirror in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to look into special effects. And by special effects, I mean things like color effects. Uh, one of my favorite things to do that I cannot wait to share with you guys is a partial color effect in Elements where we drain all the color out of the image and then reveal it only in certain areas. So that's the kind of effects that we're going to be talking about. And, and handy enough, the effects actually live in a panel in Elements called the Effects Panel. Thank you, <laughs> Adobe, for making it clear. <laughs> and then the last thing we want to do is sharpen our images. And we always save that for last because it's probably the most destructive thing that you'll do to your images. When you're sharpening, just to spend a moment on what is happening when you're sharpening, uh, when you're sharpening an image, Elements goes in and tries to find edges. Now, when I say edges, it's looking for areas of really high contrast. On this screen, the high contrast areas would be, you know, the white text next to the charcoal gray background. Well, when Elements finds gray areas of contrast like that, it thinks it's an edge. So it goes along in, in a very small uh, width around what it has determined to be an edge and it makes the bright part a little bit brighter along that edge and it makes the dark part a little bit darker along that edge. 
So with that much change in your image, it, you can ruin your image in a hurry. So that's why we save sharpening for the very last step. Okay, so now let's hop on into elements. Oh, one more little note here. If anybody in the audience is using iPhoto for your organization, iPhoto is a fabulous, uh, it's kind of like a database with an image editor plopped on top of it, which is kind of how I think of Lightroom too. <laughs> a database with an editor plopped on top of it. Uh, you can use iPhoto for your import and organization and tell it to do your editing in Elements. So if that's of use, we've got one gentleman here with a, with a beautiful MacBook Pro over here. So if you wanted to do that, you could pop open iPhoto and you want to open iPhoto's preferences. So choose iPhoto, go down to preferences and click the advanced button on the top right. And you're going to see a little pop-up menu next to uh, the tagline edit photo. So if you give that a click, then iPhoto is going to open up this open window that you see back here. And that's where you can go choose that other editor. And that could be anything you want. Okay, so that's how you would do that if that is of interest. <laughs>